Despite our title as the Garden State, most people don't think of pristine farmland and boundless greenery when they hear New Jersey. In fact, bustling turnpikes and dense smog are perhaps more apt imagery for many. Not surprisingly, New Jersey's industrial reputation dates back far before highways found the state. Endowed with fertile soil and a rich coastline, New Jersey was quickly identified as an optimal location for early settlement. Along with being a center of production, agricultural and industrial in and of itself, New Jersey is notable for its central location between New York City and Philadelphia. Locations with the Raritan Basin, highlighted in red in figure one, in particular have represented a convenient pit stop between the two great cities for centuries. In fact, the watersheds of the Raritan region are centrally located between one of the nation's first official ports of entry in the north and what has become known as the cradle of American industry in the south. As was made clear by the difficulty with which personnel and goods were transported during the Revolutionary War, there exists an immense need for an efficient means of travel between the two aforementioned regions and beyond. The remarkable density of railways and locomotive storage areas in and surrounding the Raritan Basin, then, is understandable. In fact, nearly 400 miles of active track are contained within the 1,100 square miles, which together constitute the three watershed management areas of the Raritan Basin. So to compound the environmental stress caused by the incredibly concentrated presence of locomotives in the region, it just so happens that rails, whether passenger or freight lines, within the Raritan Basin are some of the most heavily trafficked in the country. That said, New Jersey's reputation as a center of commerce and manufacturing is now, and for centuries has been, dependent upon railways. Easy means of transport makes the area an obvious choice for the establishment of mines and factories. The presence of such establishments attracts workers, an influx of labor paves the way for successful businesses, economic success fuels the need for increased access to the area, and the positive feedback loop fueled by trains continues. While a critical component of the area's economy and rich history, the high concentration of rails and associated storage areas within the Raritan Basin predisposes the region to accelerated rates of environmental and ecological degradation. For the purposes of this presentation, the consequences to soil and water introduced by locomotives within the Raritan Basin will be considered. That said, perhaps the ramifications of physical changes to the land's topography are the most readily apparent result of pervasive railways. So to properly appreciate the extent to which railways and associated infrastructure have impacted the hydrology of the Raritan Basin, it is critical that an understanding of the region's pre-existing proneness to flooding exist. To this end, it is worthwhile to note the close clustering and unique composition of the floodplains in the Raritan Basin. With regards to the former, one need only look at a representative sample of the Raritan River Basin, in this case Middlesex County, to visualize the large overlap between railroad expansion and floodplain territory. Located nearly entirely within Watershed Management Area 9, Middlesex County, as displayed in Figure 3, is nearly entirely within a 500-year floodplain. Accordingly, the prevalence of very high-risk, high-risk, and moderate-risk flood zones, classified as A, AE, and 0.2% annual chance zones, respectively, is understandable. After all, a significant portion of the Raritan River and its associated tributaries run through Middlesex County. When considered in tandem with stressors due to development, the area's predisposition to flooding becomes even more worrisome. That being the case, it is helpful to look at Figure 4, which shows the predominance of metropolitan development within Watershed Management Area 9, so to put into perspective just how drastically land features and usage have been modified in the Raritan Basin. In transitioning to Figure 5, which magnifies the townships which constitute Middlesex County, it can be seen that land untainted by infrastructure is all but absent. Seeing that we have already established Middlesex County to be susceptible to flooding, the extensive quantity of impervious surface associated with metropolitan development is truly alarming. This issue was further emphasized by Figure 6, which once again illustrates the area's heightened vulnerability to the adverse effects of rails and associated infrastructure as a consequence of urban expansion. Clearly, the conveniences of city life are obtained at the cost of dwindling wetlands and forests. Now that an understanding of the Raritan Basin's pre-existing risk factors has been established, the import of Figure 7, which shows, among other things, the layout of rails in our selected county, can be appreciated. As is made evident by the clustered colorful lines which represent distinct railways passing through the county, one can't help but be near tracks, stations, or storage areas. As before, this infrastructure exists within an area already largely depleted of its natural riparian buffers. Consequently, the removal of urban wetlands and marshes so to allow for rail expansion has resulted in decreased drainage capabilities. Along with eliminating runoff reducing infiltrating vegetation, rails built over and near floodplains in the Raritan Basin create hydrologic disconnections. 
that is, physical changes to the area's topography, such as using dynamite to blast through the clay, sandstone, and shale composing a majority of the region's land, can disrupt the progression of water through the hydrologic cycle. Constructing rails parallel to streams, for example, can cause excessive drying of the surrounding soil, resulting in decreased nutrient uptake and stunted plant growth. Furthermore, railway infrastructure introduces a wide array of chemical pollutants which can leach into the nearby soil and waterways. Of principal concern are heavy metals, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, largely from petroleum, and herbicides. While these contaminants are certainly not unique to the rails of the Raritan Basin, the aforementioned density of rails in this region, in combination with the existing lack of vegetation, makes the area particularly prone to decrements in water and soil quality. Unfortunately, recent data including detailed breakdowns of specific chemical pollutants in water and soil of the Raritan Basin are hard to come by. Common tendencies supported by large-scale studies extending beyond the basin, however, are widely available and, for the purposes of this presentation, will be assumed to be applicable to the region in question. That said, it's worth noting that these studies, conducted between 1999 and 2012, were predominantly based upon results garnered from rail studies in Germany and Poland. Admittedly, this difference in geographic location introduces a host of variables beyond the scope of this presentation. Regardless, the data support the general trend that the burning of fuel, typically diesel, and persistent leakage of petroleum from storage tanks result in markedly increased levels of PAHs in waterways which either border or cross rails. Unsurprisingly, elevated concentrations of these organic compounds are known to disturb aquatic and riparian ecosystems. Moreover, track abrasion introduces heavy metals, which constitute the track and train, into the soil surrounding rails. These metals, including nickel, cadmium, cobalt, and lead, represent a health hazard in drinking water and also threaten to stunt the growth of desperately needed runoff reducing vegetation. Finally, an oftentimes neglected consequence of railroad construction is the ensuing increase in the use of herbicides. Because the Federal Rail Administration requires that railroads keep their tracks free of weeds so to preserve optimal, optimal visibility, railroad companies are often rather liberal with application of weed control products. While this helps to maintain immaculate tracks, many herbicides are harmful to nearby fauna and, to make matters worse, have relatively low biodegradability. Troubling as the concerns that I have mentioned thus far are, it's no shock that local communities have already taken steps to rectify the issues. In fact, I'm sure many of you are well aware of the increasingly popular rail trails throughout the state, which repurpose abandoned tracks as paths for pedestrians and bikers. While this helps to repair disrupted ecosystems through the introduction of select vegetation, it does nothing to mitigate the consequences of active lines. To this end, some rail companies around the country have made a point of publicizing efforts to minimize infiltration issues introduced by rails. For example, gypsum, a mineral which can be purchased relatively inexpensively in pellet form, is often spread surrounding tracks to increase the porosity of the soil. Whether comparable steps have been taken within the Raritan Basin, however, is information I have been unsuccessful in obtaining. That said, there is significant room for improvement with regards to responsible rail management within the Raritan Basin. In addition to using minerals to promote water absorption, which I mentioned has already been done in other areas, communities could advocate for improved maintenance of railway ballasts and the surrounding soil. A relatively simple step involves ensuring that appropriate quantities of compost or mulch are laid near tracks so to slow soil erosion. Better yet, long-lasting modifications could be made to the underlying infrastructure of the rail ballasts so to reduce the necessary frequency of maintenance. For example, installation of geocells, which are three-dimensional, highly durable panels which offer reinforcement along railways, have the potential to aid in soil stabilization despite unabating exposure to loads exceeding 18,000 tons. Accordingly, Figure 8 summarizes the results obtained following the 2017 incorporation of geocell technology in select rails of northern England. As can be seen, track quality index, which in this case quantifies the number of track defects per one kilometer of rail, has markedly improved. Likewise, track deterioration, which measures degradation of the track bed on an annual basis, has decreased. So far as chemical pollutants are concerned, engineering can once again be put into practice. Namely, surface water treatment devices could be installed to capture stormwater and enhance existing SUDs or sustainable drainage systems, which include high efficiency filters and retention tanks. The upflow filter, for example, is an affordable means of water treatment proven to provide reliable filtration. As presented in Figure 9, the upflow and comparable filters are capable of removing approximately 80% of contaminants, despite increases in sediment mass load, wherein sediment load refers to the solid matter to which the filter is exposed. 
Through sharing these suggestions, complete with the historical background and biological backing which lend credence to their validity to the chosen freeholders in the counties within the Raritan Basin watersheds, I would hope to inspire an increase in the environmental literacy of the elected officials who are in a position to make appeals to the railroad companies whose tracks run through the region. Ideally, equipping these representatives with a comprehensive conceptual understanding of the issues at hand would be sufficient to set in motion a community-wide concern for the currently under-addressed environmental ramifications of railways. Optimally, this would ultimately result in legislative changes and implementation of increasingly stringent building and maintenance regulations. Even if not, however, activism at the community level could inspire future generations to think of transit in an increasingly environmental context. Of course, it's natural to wonder why this transition in thought matters. After all, if rails and locomotives cause so many problems, why not do away with them altogether? The fact of the matter is that rails remain an environmentally viable alternative to other modes of transport, and, for this reason, are worth re-evaluation rather than elimination. In understanding the problems that do exist with rail systems, individuals can be empowered to put the knowledge and resources we have, as a society in and beyond the Raritan Basin, to good use. In this way, the issues that have been a focus of this presentation can be made a relic of the past.